So I want to welcome everyone to Healthcare Clinical Research Specialist course here at Wake Tech. Um, the subtitle of the course is Clinical Research Administration, Regulations, and Data Collection. My name is Steve Pope. I'll be your instructor uh, for the course. It will last 18 weeks. Uh, it will be given online. There will be two in-class meetings. And I'm making this uh, video available for those of you who were not in the first class uh, meeting for so that you can uh, get the content and you won't be you won't fall behind. So our, our in our final week of class, we'll have another in class meeting that I'll discuss a little bit further as we go into the course. So our primary um, online environment for the course is going to be Moodle. You'll get to that via the Wake Tech website. I'll go over that in just a moment. The uh, classroom portion of our course will be conducted at the Beltline Center, which is right here in Raleigh, uh, right off of right off of the Beltline, kind of behind uh, Duke Raleigh Hospital. I'm sure many of you can find that without any problem. And I'll be providing the room number, you know, because that will change, you know, as we go through the course. So I'll make sure that you know where to go and you have all of that uh, completed. We went over our course introductions um, during the first class. Uh, for those of you that were not in class, there'll be a discussion forum on Moodle. But I'd like for you to introduce yourself uh, to your other classmates. And what I'd like for you to do is just answer the following question. Just tell us who you are, uh, what you do if you work, if you work in our field, that'd be great to know. Um, what experience do you have? What knowledge or, or experience do you have working in clinical trials or, or, or what knowledge do you have of clinical trials? Also, tell me what you hope to get out of the course. Everyone comes to this course with a little different perspective. Um, so we want to know kind of what you hope to get out of it. And then finally, we want to know how did you learn about the course? Um, did you stumble across it looking on the Wake Tech website? Did someone tell you about it and then you sought it out? Or, you know, how did you learn about it? Uh, we want to promote um, this course as best we can. It's helpful to know how students are learning about the course. So as I mentioned, our learning environment is going to be the Moodle environment. Some of you may be familiar with it. Some of you may not be familiar with it. If you've used other environments such as Blackboard, um, you probably find this very similar. Um, basically, there's a couple things you need to, to know first. First of all, Google Chrome works best. So Moodle works best using Google Chrome. So I'd like for you to hopefully use that if you can. Um, another item is that for some of you, you have email addresses that are at the waketech.edu uh, domain. If you have one of these, please do not use this on the Moodle environment. For some reason, it just doesn't work. Um, if you have a Gmail address or a Yahoo address, please use that instead. Um, when I send out announcements during the course, I'll send those out so that you will, it will appear in your email. And if you don't have an email address that's compatible with Moodle, you won't get those. You'll still be able to see them when you go on the Moodle site but it's helpful for you to, to get those uh, right away because you might go a day or two without looking at the Moodle environment and I don't want you to miss out on any information. And finally, you're going to have assignments each week. They will be available beginning Monday morning at 1 a.m. Now, I don't expect anyone to be up at 1 a.m. waiting for next week's assignment, but I just point that out because as soon as you get as soon as you're able to on Monday, please go ahead and open up Moodle and see what uh, what your learning objectives and assignments are going to be for that week. If you have any questions about it, certainly certainly let me know. When you bring up Moodle for the first time, you're going to have to log in using the following formula. So your username is going to be the first letter of your first name the first letter of your middle name, if you have one, and then your last name. Um, finally, the last two digits of your social security number um, it, uh, will be included in that as well. 
So there's an example here, a student name, Susie Q student. We use the login SQ student 33, where 33 is the last two digits of their social security number. And then finally, the password that you'll use will be your birthday, which will be in the following format, uh, two digits for the month, two digits for the day, and two digits for the year. And then once you get in there, you'll be able to change your password. You won't be able to change your, um, your login uh, name, uh, but you'll be able to change your password um, you know, once you get in there. So use that uh, format to log in for the first time and then change your password after you get on there. For those of you not familiar with the Moodle environment, this is a screenshot of what it looks like. You basically will have three panels, um, the navigation panel and the activities panel that are on the left. You probably won't access very many items on that panel. You're going to spend most of your time on the panel that's in the center. So as you see, uh, the first panel there says welcome to healthcare, clinical research. Those are the things that kind of get you oriented. And then each week you'll have one for that week's assignment. So one thing that you'll need to do right away is get on there and complete the activity entitled, Are You Ready for Online Learning? It's a short survey of questions, probably will take you just a few minutes, but you'll need to, uh, you'll need to complete that um, as soon as you can so that, uh, because the, uh, the rest of the course won't populate in Moodle until you do that. So if you have any questions about it, let me know, but it should be fairly simple. It should be easy for you to get that done. Here's another screenshot of the Moodle environment. Uh, this is what you'll see when you pull it up and you begin to look at the week one material. And this will be similar for, for every week uh, during the course. So you'll have, uh, it'll be identified with the week number and then also what the topic is for that week. And then you'll have a, a series of, of options there. There'll be a couple of files that you'll open up and read. And then you'll probably have a discussion forum uh, for most weeks. And, um, and I'll go over those in a little more detail. Uh, I'll also put my YouTube videos out there so you'll have a link to those. You can click on those. The lecture is going to pop up in YouTube. You can listen to it. I'll also have the presentations out there that you can, can <coughs> excuse me, that you can download <coughs> and print out to sort of go along with. So let's spend a moment to get oriented and to get introduced to the con uh, content. I usually like to use this pretest uh, as a way of kind of gauging. Uh, the student's level of understanding of clinical trials. So it's just four very simple questions here. Um, what is a sponsor in a clinical trial? Explain what a principal investigator is. What authority regulates clinical trials? And what is a CRF? So if you're not sure what the answers to those questions are, I'll, I'll, I'll explain them to you. So the sponsor in a clinical trial is going to be the company that stands to benefit financially once the drug or the device is approved for sale. Um, so that's normally going to be a, a pharma company or a medical device company because it's going to be their product that they want to get approved uh, for sale. A principal investigator is the person that conducts the clinical trial at their particular clinical site. So that's going to be a physician um, that's going to uh, have a clinical site where they've got a team of people that works with them to conduct the trial. And every trial uh, is going to have you know, a, a collection of sites. Some trials may only have 10 or 12 sites. Other trials may have you know, hundreds of sites, depending on what the nature and size of the trial is. What authority regulates clinical trials in the United States? It would be the US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. Uh, it could be the National Institutes of Health. Uh, depending on who's conducting the trial. And then finally, what is a CRF? A CRF is a case report form, which is the principal instrument that we use to collect data um, in a clinical trial. That could be collected on paper, using a paper CRF. 
or in, in most cases it's going to be collected using an electronic uh, data collection um, device on, on a computer. So you're going to have a database where someone goes in there and enters information, you know, not unlike how you would enter information, say, in Amazon.com if you're buying a book or something on there. You enter your name and address. It'd be very similar. So we'd just be entering the clinical data that we're collecting uh, in the trial. And then finally, the course syllabus and outline. I've posted that out on Moodle. Um, certainly go out there and take a look at it. I want you to read through it, probably print it out um, and be familiar with it. Uh, it's going to contain all the information that you need uh, for the course. It's going to contain the uh, three textbooks uh, that you're going to need for the course. So go ahead if you haven't done so already. Please go ahead and uh, purchase those. You can get them on Amazon. You can get them on other internet sites. Uh, please pay, uh, pay attention to which editions you're getting. I want to make sure that you get the correct edition. Um, you should find those pretty readily available. Uh, you probably won't need them your, during your first week because all the content that we're going to go over, I've actually posted uh, out there on Moodle, so you'll have access to it. Uh, but if you have questions about it, certainly, uh, certainly let me know. Your learning objectives for this first week will be um, to discuss and understand the structure of a clinical trial. I'll be going over that here in just a moment with a, a series of narrated slides that will help you understand that. Also to describe the drug development timeline and phases of clinical trials. Also to cite the participants in a clinical trial. We have a lot of people that participate. Either they're a patient or a subject. We also have principal investigators, and we have people that work for the pharma company that are associated with that. So I'm going to go over all of those here in just a moment so it'll make more sense to you. And then finally, we're going to discuss the uh, clinical trial life cycle and what that's all about, how that works, so that you'll be fairly familiar uh, with that. So what is a clinical trial? Well, the short answer is it's an experiment. A clinical trial is a research study in human subjects designed to answer specific questions about the use of a drug or device as a possible treatment therapy that generates safety and efficacy data. And we're going to talk about the difference between safety and efficacy data. So what we're attempting to do in our clinical trial is we want to generate a data set um, where our study drug has been studied in a population of patients and then we want to take that data set and analyze it to determine whether or not our drug or device is safe and effective. And once we've done that and we're satisfied with that, then we want to submit that to a regulatory authority such as the Food and Drug Administration and have them approve it for marketing so that we can then go sell it to patients. The clinical trial involves a principal investigator who conducts the trial with oversight from an institutional review board. According to the study protocol, regulatory authority requirements, and good clinical practice guidelines. So a principal investigator is going to be a physician, a doctor, who in most cases is going to be working at an academic medical center or some other big medical facility where they do a lot of research. Uh, the trial is going to be overseen by the Institutional Review Board, which in many cases is going to be an adjunct of that medical facility. However, in some cases it might be a central uh, Institutional Review Board. Central Institutional Review Boards are for-profit companies that oversee research on behalf of sponsors and on behalf of doctors. And then they're going to do this in accordance to the study protocol. And we're going to talk about that a little later. That's going to be the document that explains everything that we're going to do, how we're going to conduct our trial. And then also with regulatory authority requirements. So in, in the case of the United States, the Food and Drug Administration, or in some cases, the National Institutes of Health, depending on what jurisdiction it falls under. 
is going to have certain regulatory requirements that we are required to abide by and we're required to conduct the trial by. And then finally, we've got good clinical practice guidelines, which uh, there are a number of those. The ones that you're going to be most familiar with that we're going to talk about some in our course here is going to be from ICH, the International Conference on Harmonization and their good clinical practice guidelines, which are contained in E6 of their guidance. And we'll go over a few of those as we go along through the course. Uh, but these are guidelines that have been accepted by most of the nations around the world, so they're fairly uniform from country to country. Uh, some of the regulatory agencies in certain countries will have additional requirements that we may have to be aware of and may have to follow. So it's important that we understand that. And then finally, the data collected by the principal investigator or the PI on behalf of the sponsor is submitted to the regulatory authority for approval to market the drug to humans within the regulatory authority's jurisdiction. And it's important to understand that even if a trial is being conducted under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, in many cases, you may have clinical or clinical sites that are overseas, that are in Europe or South America or China. It's important to understand that the U.S. FDA still has jurisdiction even in those locations. So they can require that a principal investigator adhere to certain um, uh, regulatory requirements, uh, even though they may be outside the United States. This diagram explains the drug development timeline and basically provides a, a primer for how long it takes to get a drug to market. So if you look over on the left hand side of our graph here, you'll see that we've got zero to 12. That would be the time in years uh, that you see there. And if you'll, if you'll notice in the first uh, portion of our diagram there, our preclinical testing occurs in years zero to three. So it takes about three years where we're testing our, our drug with animals and laboratories. Uh, this, this could be um, in, uh, in vitro. Uh, it could be um, using larger animals. We might start out uh, with small mice, and then we'll progress up to larger mammals. Primarily what we're trying to do is determine um, the toxicity of the drug. You know, how, much, how much of a dose does it take to kill the animal? So essentially, we're, we're really looking to figure out at what dose does it kill half of the animals in our population. That gives us an idea of where the toxicity level is and where that may pertain uh, to humans. So once we've begun to kind of test that and, and figure out where that is, then we can progress into our, our testing in human subjects. And we start out in phase one, phase one, Trials are conducted on healthy volunteers. We usually will have anywhere from 10 to 100 in a particular trial. And what we're trying to do is trying to figure, figure out um, how the dosing is going to work. Um, in many cases, these phase one trials are conducted in special facilities. Uh, we have some right around the triangle, uh, right around here, where you'll, you'll hear of people going to the facility and they may spend the weekend there, spend a few days, they stay overnight, they're kind of sequestered there. You get a lot of college students, you get a lot of, um, you get some indigent patients that take it, that participate in these. Um, there are even people out there that actually make a living participating in these phase one trials. So what we're trying to do is figure out where the, what doses are safe for people to take. Now, we're not trying to kill people in these trials, in these phase one trials, but we're trying to figure out, you know, at what dose can they, can they tolerate the medication. So once we complete the phase one testing, we're going to move in phase two testing. And in phase two testing, we're going to get a larger population of patients. These are going to be patients that, that suffer from the, the medical indication. So if it's, you know, heart disease or diabetes or asthma or you know, whatever it may be, 
uh, we're going to have specific inclusion exclusion criteria for those patients and we're going to get people that suffer from that um, from that disease indication and then what we're trying to find out here once again we want to find out what the optimum dose is for the drug but we also want to start to collect some of our efficacy data because we want to see if our drug is actually benefiting these people because after all they do suffer from the medical indication so once we feel satisfied that we've collected data and we feel like we can move to phase three, at that point, we're going to expand it to a larger population of patients. <clears throat> this is where uh, you're going to see multiple centers, multiple, in some cases, multiple countries involved in these phase three trials. They're going to be larger uh, patient populations. And in these trials, we're going to introduce uh, multiple treatment arms into our trials. So we may have, say, a blinded trial where we've got one population of, stu or of, 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 uh, of patients getting the study drug, and then we've got another population of patients that are maybe getting a placebo, and we want to see how the data differs between the two. Or we may want to do some type of head-to-head -head comparison between our drug and maybe a drug that's already on the market. So we may see those in our phase three trials as well. Um, we've got larger populations of patients. This is where we're really gonna hopefully collect the data that's gonna make it, uh, give it, give us a chance to submit this data to the regulatory authority, to the FDA, mm -hmm. and hopefully they'll approve it. So this gives you an idea of the timeline required and you can see it, it takes generally 11 to 12 years or longer for a drug to go through all of this testing, all of this series of research before the drug is able to be approved uh, to be uh, given to patients. This graphic here illustrates the drug development timeline and uh, adds a little variation to it. As you can see over on the left side, we still have our preclinical testing and research and development, and that can be anywhere from one to three years in duration. And then that column in the middle where you see the arrows that identify the phase one, phase two, and phase three studies, these are conducted over a longer period of time. And then you'll notice the, the smaller columns there in the middle the NDA review, that is the new drug application. So once we've completed enough phase three trials that we feel like we have enough data to submit, we're going to submit a new drug application to the FDA. It's probably going to take them at least a year or more to, to analyze that. They're going to come back with questions. We're going to have a series of meetings. The statisticians are going to drive a lot of that because they're going to want to assess safety and efficacy of our drug versus uh, what we found in the other trials. And then once we get our drug approved, then we're going to go into what's called post-marketing surveillance. Uh, this is often referred to as phase four studies. And in phase four studies, these are done on drugs that are already approved, already out there in the marketplace, being prescribed by doctors, what we're trying to do is, is further enhance the safety profile of that drug. We're trying to do our adverse event and adverse drug reaction reporting. We wanted to find if there anything anything new is happening out there. Um, and then we're going to submit that data to the FDA as well. So this gives you a little variation on that drug development timeline. So let's talk about some of the clinical trial players, some of the key, uh, key folks and key organizations that are instrumental in our trial. Uh, the first is going to be the sponsor. The sponsor is the company or entity that produces the drug or device and then stands to benefit financially from its successful approval. Um, you know who many of the big drug companies are around the world. We've got Glaxo, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, Merck. Um, many of you are going to be familiar with these drugs. You may be familiar with some of the products that they have. But the sponsor of, of the trial is going to be the drug company or the medical device company if it's a device trial uh, that stands to benefit from the approval. 
The clinical site uh, is going to be headed by the principal investigator. Remember, we talked about that in an earlier slide. The principal investigator is going to be a doctor, a physician, in many cases working at an academic medical center. Uh, the site enrolls patients or study subjects in the trial and then conducts the trial according to the protocol. So essentially the way it works is the sponsor essentially hires the doctor to conduct the trial. Now they're going to be in most trials, in your phase two and phase three trials, they're going to be multiple sites, multiple doctors. You may, it's not uncommon, you may have a trial that has you know, 30 or 40 or 50 sites or more, uh, depending on its complexity. And they may be around the country, around the world, uh, depending on, on how they have it set up. So the principal investigator is going to actually see the patients, administer the study drug, collect the data, and then provide that to the sponsor um, as they go along. A couple of the other uh, clinical trial players, the Institutional Review Board. We talked about them uh, earlier. The Institutional Review Board is responsible for the safety of human subjects. They oversee the PI and they approve the study protocol. They also approve the informed consent documents that are used to consent the patients and also study materials that are used such as dosing diaries or um, any advertisements that are used to attract patients for the trial. The IRB has to approve all of those, all of those documents. Anything that is presented before, the, before a patient or before the public, the IRB has to approve that. Um, as I mentioned earlier on an earlier slide, we have local IRBs and we have central IRBs. Local IRBs are part of academic uh, medical centers um, or some other medical entity. A central IRB is a for-profit company that oversees research for sponsors and investigators. There are a number of, of um, central IRBs around the country. We have several of them that operate right here in our area. Um, and they can, be, they can be large companies or they can be smaller companies. Just depends on what their what their capabilities are, but it's important to understand the difference between the two. One, the local IRB is actually a part of a larger medical facility, whereas the central IRB is a standalone company. A couple of more players here. We have the regulatory authority. That's going to be the government agency that regulates the approval, sale, and distribution of drug and device therapies. Examples of them. The FDA here in the United States, National Institutes of Health. We also have state and local agencies that may be involved uh, as regulatory authorities uh, with respect to a clinical trial. Uh, of course, we have the patients. Those are the human volunteers, human subjects who volunteer to participate in the clinical trials. And then we have contract research organizations or CROs these are companies that administer and monitor clinical trials on behalf of a sponsor. So in many cases, you may have pharma companies, you know, such as a Glaxo or a Pfizer or a Merck that may outsource the administration and the monitoring of the trial to a CRO. Uh, we're lucky that we have quite a few CROs here in our area. There are probably at least 20. Uh, the larger ones are quintiles. PPD, Parkcell, PRA, and then there are a number of, of smaller ones that, that uh, don't get quite as much press. But basically, the CRO industry is headquartered here in the Triangle area of North Carolina. We have those four that I mentioned are the four largest CROs uh, in the world. Quintiles is headquartered right here. PPD is headquartered in Wilmington. Uh, PRA is headquartered here in Raleigh. Um, Park Cell has a significant operation here locally in Durham, even though they aren't headquartered here. Uh, they still have a very large presence. This graphic um, shows us essentially in a nutshell uh, kind of the process, the, the timeline, the sequence of events that occurs in the in the in a clinical trial. So we start out in the kind of in the, the upper left corner there we have an approved protocol 
So we've got a protocol document that explains how we're going to conduct our trial. These documents can be anywhere from 100 to maybe 200 pages, usually around that, that range is what they consist of. Uh, they explain all of the assessments that are going to be done, all the visits that are going to occur, um, how the patients are going to be selected, uh, the inclusion exclusion criteria. Uh, anything that's going to take place in that trial is going to be discussed um, in that protocol. <clears throat> the next thing we're going to do after we've got our approved protocol is we're going to start to select our investigators. These are our principal investigators. Remember, they're the doctors that conduct the trial. So a couple of things that we're going to be looking for in that selection process, we're going to look for doctors that have participated in clinical trials in the past, that also have experience in the therapeutic area uh, that our trial is, is, is being conducted in. You know, for example, if we have a cancer trial, we want to have doctors that are treating cancer patients. We don't really want to have doctors that are treating um, patients for asthma or doctors that are just general practitioners. They would not be good selections um, for us for our cancer trial. Um, on the contrary, if we are doing, say, a diabetes trial, we want to have doctors that are, for, that are treating patients for diabetes. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for research experience and we're looking for therapeutic expertise. So then we go through an approval process. We're approving the doctors that are going to participate in our trial. Um, not every doctor is going to want to participate. Some of them may have competing protocols and that may limit their, their, uh, their, their interest in participating. Uh, we're going to pay these doctors and in some cases, some of the doctors say, well, you're not paying me enough money, so I'm not going to participate. So we go through this approval process, and then once we've got our, our doctors approved and uh, they've got their, their IRB approval for their site, then they can start um, recruiting patients and having them participate in the trial. So the patients come in for their visits, the doctors conduct the visits, perform the assessments that we want them to perform, of the trial, collect the data that they're going to provide to us, and then, at, then they start providing that. Okay, so then our da the data is going to be entered, and it's going to be reviewed by our staff at the, at the sponsor, the pharma company, or it could be the CRO if it's outsourced to a CRO. So we're going to start reviewing that data, and we're going to start cleaning it. And a big part of what we're going to learn in this course is how we do that and how important that is. Once we have a clean data set, we're going to send it over to our biostatisticians. They're going to run their statistical analysis on our data. They're going to slice it and dice it and try to determine whether or not it reveals our, our drug was safe and effective. And then once we feel confident that we've done that, we're probably going to start presenting that data in, at some medical conferences. So we may want to present that um, at some medical conferences, and then once we've got our data ready, we're going to submit it for registration. We're going to submit it to the FDA for regulatory approval. Hopefully they'll approve it, and we can start selling it to patients and helping them out. This graphic explains the clinical trial lifestyle in a, in a little varied attempt. Uh, we start over on the left-hand side with our light bulb going off. So we feel like we've got a compound that shows some promise in the laboratory. We've done some, we've done our animal testing, our preclinical testing. We feel like it has a lot of merit. So we develop our, our clinical trial plans and our protocol. So we write our protocol, we order our clinical trial materials, uh, we develop a case report form or a database depending on whether or not we're going to do a, an electronic data capture study or if we're going to do, perform the study on paper. We're going to prepare our investigator brochure. That's going to be a document that explains all of the science behind our compound. We're going to give these to the doctors. We're going to require that they read it. We're going to require that they sign a piece of paper saying that they read it. Uh, it's going to explain the, the, the uh, the preclinical testing that we've done, any previous testing in humans is going to be listed in there. 
Uh, if we go look at our ICH E6 Section 7 regulation or, or guideline, excuse me, uh, it discusses all the information that should be in our investigator brochure. So we're going to provide that to the doctors for them to read. Uh, then we're going to get our protocol approved. We're going to start screening potential investigators. We're going to do some pre-initiation visits. So we're going to go out. We're going to visit their sites. We're going to make sure that they have a suitable site, that they've got all the resources they need in order to conduct our trial. We negotiate our budget. We, um, um, we conduct an investigator meeting where we might get all the doctors together in one location to discuss our trial, answer questions that they may have. Then we're going to select the investigators. And then hopefully we're going to go and conduct our trial and get everything approved to then get things, get things rolling. So this graphic de depicts the clinical trial lifestyle and a, and a little bit of a variation. Um, for those, for you scientists out there, you probably remember the scientific method. So this sort of explains that or uses that as a, as a mechanism for explaining the clinical trial life cycle. So we start out in our preclinical stage uh, there at the lower left hand corner. This is kind of the theory stage. So we're starting to develop our hypothesis to determine, um, you know, whether or not what we have is suitable. Uh, then after we get through with the preclinical stage, we go into our modeling stage, which is our phase one stage. You know, here we're trying to determine our toxicity levels and, and learn a little bit more about how our drug behaves in the body, what it does to the body, what the body does to it. That would be our pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic uh, studies that we do in phase one. Then in phase two, we start uh, introducing our product into patients that already have the disease indication. So we're trying to determine, you know, what doses are acceptable. We start to collect some of the efficacy data, start to see if it's being effective. And then we move on to phase three, which is going to be our, our definitive trial and our, our model here. Um, so then we're going to really expand it, increase the number of patients, get a good view of what the statistical analysis is starting to look like, uh, kind of compare our drug with, with other treatment possibilities, either placebo or, or currently marketed uh, medication. And then finally in the phase four, we're kind of doing, we're collecting some long-term safety data. We're enhancing the safety profile of our, of our, uh, of our product to make sure it continues to be safe and effective. So finally, this graphic depicts the scientific method. Um, you probably remember uh, remember some of this from, from being in school. With our scientific method, uh, the first step is to ask a question. Second step is to state what we think our hypothesis is. And in step three, we're going to conduct an experiment to test our hypothesis. And then we'll analyze the results. Did it work? Did it not work? And then we form some conclusions based on what those results are. So a clinical trial operates in very much the same way. Um, clinical trials, and, and the per for the purpose of our diagram here, it mainly resides in steps three and four, which is to conduct an experiment and to analyze the results. Uh, but it really touches all, all the different steps here in the scientific method. So in, in data management, what we're trying to do is clean the data so that it's free of errors, so that the data set can be as accurate as possible before we get to the analysis step, uh, which you can see is in step four there. So it's important to understand that a clinical trial is basically a large science experiment. So we're trying to determine, is our product safe and effective? Let's collect data and determine if that's indeed the case. So for your discussion forum for this week, as I mentioned early on, I'd like for you to introduce yourself to the class. Um, tell us who you are, what your experience is, if any, in clinical research, you know, where you work and live, perhaps, um, what you hope to get out of the course, 
maybe what your future plans are, and do tell us how you learned about the course. Um, you know, if you want to provide any personal information, if you have a family or, or anything like that, you don't have to do that. But if you want to review, if you want to discuss that, that's fine. And then finally, I'd like for you to, if you haven't done so already, to please send your contact information to me at the email address below. Um, for those that uh, were not in class um, earlier this week, please let me know what your mailing address is so that we can get your certificate out to you at the end of the course. Please let me know if you have questions about that. So after you've gone on the discussion board and you've introduced yourself to the class, uh, and hopefully you've looked at the other introductions, so you're kind of familiar with your classmates. Uh, your first assignment uh, for week one, session one, is going to be to find an article that discusses a clinical trial from a newspaper or some other news source and describe the following questions. What was studied and by whom? What data was collected? What result was reported? and then go ahead and post that to the discussion board. Now it's important, I want you to understand it, this does not have to be a current article. It could be an article from a year or two ago. And I would encourage you to try to choose maybe a disease or an ailment that you're familiar with. Maybe something that either you suffer with or maybe a family member or someone you know suffers from because you'll be a little more motivated to go try to look, try to look this up. And I think it'll, you'll get a little bit more out of it if there's some sort of personal connection to that. So it's a very simple exercise. It won't take you very long to do this. <clears throat> Just find an article, you know, post the link to the article in your, uh, in your discussion board posting. You know, tell us what was studied and by whom. The whom is going to be a pharma company. Um, but it could be, it could be something, someone that could be a, could be a, a, a you know, a physician initiated trial. Uh, but most times it's going to be a pharma company. Then what data did they collect? The, the article will indicate that. And then what was the, what result was reported? So go ahead and get that done. You'll need to get that up there before the end of this week. Uh, so that'll be your, one of your first assignments uh, to do this week. In case any of you were feeling a little bit puzzled uh, by the assignment for finding the article, I'm going to give you an example of one here that I think will help you understand a little bit more. This is a news story that appeared in the New York Times uh, back in May 21st of 2013. So you can see that was nearly, uh, nearly two years ago. Um, and what it describes is a new asthma drug that was developed by Sanofi and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals that can help or may help patients whose condition is not well controlled by existing medicines, according to the results of a small clinical trial that they released uh, earlier that week. So in a 12-week study, the number of asthma attacks for other outbreaks of symptoms decreased by 87% in those getting the drug compared to those that got a placebo. So other measures of lung function and disease control also improved. So according to the study, the study results, excuse me, which were published online Tuesday in the New England Journal of Medicine and presented at an annual meeting of the American Thoracic Society of, in Philadelphia. So I've included the link there at the bottom to the, to the article that appeared in the New York Times. Um, so if we take a look at what, at what our assignment is, okay, what was studied? Um, a new asthma medication, a new asthma therapy. And who is it studied by? Two pharma companies, Sanofi and Regeneron. What data was collected? If you look in the second paragraph, over a 12-week study, they collected the number of asthma attacks or other outbreaks of symptoms in the patients. So how many asthma attacks did they suffer from during that 12-week period? And then what were the results? Well, the result indicated that uh, the symptoms decreased by 87% in those getting the drug uh, versus those that got a placebo. So hopefully, and this, this is more than likely a double-blinded uh, study, so the patient doesn't know whether, whether they're getting the study drug or whether they're getting the placebo. 
So a, a decrease in symptoms of 87% is pretty significant. So it sounds like that, that we may be able to generalize that in a larger population of patients and point to some pretty decent results. So we might want to keep, uh, keep our eye on that drug, see if it gets approved um, at some point. As you go through this assignment, you know, please make sure that you use some reputable um, news sources. I know there are a lot of um, you know, websites and blogs and things like that out there. But what I really want you to look for is something that uh, has appeared in, in a reputable newspaper or maybe on a, on a television station someplace. That would be fine as well. Uh, so if you'll go ahead and do that, uh, I don't think it'll take you very long to do it. Post your results, post your answers to those questions on the discussion board, and do choose a, a indication that you have some experience with or some prior knowledge of. I think you'll find that you'll get a lot more out of it. So at any rate, that concludes our first session for week one. Go ahead and get uh, things completed on the discussion board, and then Move on to your second lecture uh, later this week, which will be on the data management plan. For your week one assignment, we've got a couple of reading items for you to participate in during the week. Um, first of all, I'd like you to read chapter one of entitled History of Regulations. This is taken from a book called A Horse Named Jim, which was actually published by the Duke Clinical Research Institute. In this chapter, it will give you a, a synopsis of all of the major legislative and regulatory issues and, and milestones that have occurred from way back as far as 1865 up to the current day that govern the use of pharmaceuticals and medical devices. So please uh, read through that. I think you'll find it to be very interesting. It's not a difficult read. Um, but I do want you to be familiar with at least with the major pieces of, of legislation and, and regulation that govern our industry and how we operate. From the textbook, uh, read uh, the chapter on scandals and tragedies in research uh, of research with human participants. I think you'll find that uh, article to be very interesting. Uh, also, the uh, ethics and clinical research article. Uh, is written by Henry Beecher, which uh, is a milestone article in terms of ethics related to clinical research, uh, and I think you'll enjoy it. Also, uh, racism and research will be very interesting, detailing some of the uh, some of the egregious uh, acts that have occurred in the past. There are going to be three historical documents in this first week uh, that we'll read: the Nuremberg Code the Declaration of Helsinki, and the Belmont Report. These are milestone documents cataloging uh, ethics as they relate to clinical research, and those three documents, along with a few others, uh, make up the cornerstone or the basis for our current regulatory environment. So please read through them. I don't think you'll find them very difficult to read. Uh, you'll also see them a little later on as we go through good clinical practice and as we uh, participate, as you participate in one of your projects. So please take a look at that uh, and then look at the, um, the discussion board question. I think you'll find it to be uh, very straightforward. Uh, the discussion board this week, I'd like for you to introduce yourself to the class. Uh, as I said before, many of us know each other from the data management class, but there are going to be a few of us that are that are new to this class. So please take time to introduce yourself to the class and then also go ahead and post your response to um, the week one discussion board. And of course, that'll be on the discussion board section of Blackboard. If you have any questions, please post it to the uh, to the instructor questions on Blackboard. And we'll look forward to having a good first week.